I think that as children, most of us are creative. Somewhere along the line, we start to believe that we're not for whatever reason, because the kid next to us can draw or somebody said, well, you're not creative. You should be an accountant, you know? So it's usually an external force that starts to shut it down for people. That's Robin Landa, distinguished professor at King University, designer and author of 25 books covering topics on idea generation, creativity, branding, and much more. So it's no surprise that she is also a creativity expert. And in her latest book, Robin busts through the myth that only certain people are creative. If you start out by saying, I'm not creative, I'm not one of those people, that shuts everything down. And so I would say, don't do that. <laughs> it's not productive. And you can learn to tap into your creativity. On this episode, Robin tells Kelly about her groundbreaking book, The New Art of Ideas. In it, she breaks down her novel ideation framework and the ways that some of the greatest ideas, works of art, and business innovations were created, often through simple curiosity. It's a fascinating conversation that has Kelly and I convinced that we are all creative if we just allow ourselves to be. Welcome to The Breakout, a show about smashing through life's little boxes and forging your own path. I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. And I'm Kelly Gunther. Carrie and I are people and change experts and best friends. We've spent more than 25 years helping organizations navigate change and get the best out of their people. Come on, we know change is hard, but staying the same can even be harder. On The Breakout, we prove that you can escape expectations and best of all, we show you how. So you're known as a creativity guru. I always love people who are gurus and who've spent their, their lives really becoming an expert. Tell us your background and what you do. I help people unlock their creative potential. I help them understand strategic creativity and how to generate worthwhile ideas. And I do that using my own new framework, an ideation framework and existing frameworks and also a variety of thinking tools. I came to this throughout my education. I always wanted to be in the visual arts or I wanted to be a dancer at one point. But um, so I've always been a kind of a student of creativity and it's always been part of my life. And because I have to teach my university students how to generate ideas on a daily basis because they are going into a profession that demands that. My university students are aspiring art directors and brand designers and UI UX designers. Those people have to generate not only an idea, but many ideas every day. And so I've really made uh, an effort, and I think I'm very successful at it, of teaching them how to do that. That's amazing. You've taken all your expertise, your research, obviously you're a distinguished professor, and you put all of that effort into this new book, The New Art of Ideas. Yeah, I'm really excited about this book because it's, as far as I understand it, the first new ideation framework since the mid 20th century. So that's a long time not to have anything new. And I'm sure you're familiar with brainstorming. Well, that was mid 20th century. That was Alex Osborne. And he created the framework of brainstorming. And it was originally thought of as a group activity. And my students and the professionals who I consult with really find it frustrating because in the brainstorming process, you have to throw out either a partially formed idea or a fully formed idea. But how do you form the idea? And so that's one issue with brainstorming. There are other methods that people use that are tried and true, but they're also somewhat frustrating because in a standard process where you do your research, which everybody has to do, you allow it to incubate, which is great. And then the third step is illumination. And that's the step where you're supposed to have the aha moment, where the idea is supposed to pop out of your head the way Athena popped out of Zeus's head, fully born. But again, how? How do you form that? And so my book really teaches people how to form 
an idea, and not just any idea, but a worthwhile idea, an idea that benefits either individuals, society, creatures, or the planet. So our show is about breaking away from expectation. I wonder what stops us from being who we really are. You know, that's ultimately what we're kind of trying to solve for. And so from your perspective, what are the things that you think stop people from really being creative or thinking outside the box? Well, first, I think that a lot of people practice negative self-talk. And if you start out by saying, I'm not creative, I'm not one of those people, that shuts everything down. And so I would say, don't do that. (laughs) It's not productive. And you can learn to tap into your creativity. I think that as children, most of us are creative. Somewhere along the line, we start to believe that we're not for whatever reason, because the kid next to us can draw or the other kid can play an instrument or somebody said, well, you're not creative. You should be an accountant, you know? So it's usually an external force that starts to shut it down for people, but you can acquire creative traits. There are people who are naturally creative and it's their traits that we want to examine. The fact that they're curious people, the fact that they are, tend to be open-minded the fact that they're open to looking for possibilities or they're open to potential in things. They're mindful listeners. They're mindful observers, meaning attentive. They're really looking at something. You don't walk into a room and say, oh, yes, chair, table, person. You're really looking. You know, or you notice color patterns or you notice shadows. And all of this can be learned. I've taught, I mean, literally thousands of people to tap into their creative potential. It's fascinating. There's um, an assessment that we do as part of, in a lot of ways, leadership development called the caliper. And one of the traits is um, idea orientation. And it's really how motivated you are. It measures motivation. It's not to say that someone can or cannot do something. It's really what motivates you. And so when something highly motivates you, it's almost like breathing. It's so natural. And then when something doesn't necessarily motivate you, it means it just draws a lot of energy out of you. You're probably more tired at the end of the day. So Carrie and I are opposites in a lot of those areas. So Carrie, she's always got ideas coming out of her. She loves a white sheet of paper, brainstorming. She's all in. She's got a a whiteboard in her office. Whereas me, on the other hand, if you said, you know, we're doing an eight hour brainstorming session, I'm going to be really tired and I might even wind up crying at some point. So, (laughs) Well, well, nobody should do an eight hour brainstorming (laughs) session. Um, But someone might be more interested and motivated and curious about it. Well, what I would tell you, Kelly, is that it's not you, it's the system. Mm. So brainstorming's not working for you. It's not yeah. it's not how you think. So don't ever think it's you, it's the system. And that kind of leads itself to the next question I was going to ask you, which is like what are some of the popular myths that you've seen maybe around idea generation? What I usually tell people is go to a museum and go to Renaissance rooms or uh, medieval rooms or even Baroque rooms and start to count the number of women artists. And you will be doomed to disappoint. Does that mean that no women were creative thinkers or had any ideas? No, they didn't have access. They weren't allowed to apprentice to study under practicing artists. They weren't allowed access to materials. The only women artists that we have from the Baroque period are those whose either brother or father were practicing artists, so they had access. So that's one myth, that no matter what, the creativity will come out. Well, that's not true. You need to have access. You need to have the right context. You need to have the right conditions. Another myth is that you have to be born that way, that it's a golden nugget of genius that exists in you and it will come out and only those people are the creative people. And again, I've witnessed it. I've taught people who are somewhat creative, not creative, think they're not creative. And as soon as you're exposed to the proper tools and the proper context and the proper thinking, you can be creative. It's unfortunate that people do think that they're not when they can be.
I was sick during this interview, so I had to miss being a part of it, but I loved listening in because Robin really confronts those limiting stories we tell about ourselves. What was so impressive is that someone like Kelly, who says all the time, I don't brainstorm, I'm not creative. I thought this is a book for people who think that. What a gift that is and how amazing that is to give to someone to think that way. When I met my husband, who's a painter, he is traditionally creative. These are traditionally what we think of creative people. You're a painter, you're a musician, you're some kind of visual arts dancer, something like that. And I said to him the same thing. I'm not creative. Just like Kelly always said, I'm not creative. And he said, what are you talking about? You're completely creative. You put these ideas together in a very creative way. So you're creative with ideas. Maybe you're not a singer or a painter, but you can be creative other ways. Stop telling yourself you're not creative. That was amazing. Like everything, there's a process, there's a framework. It's just knowing how to do it. So instituting a framework can help ease your mind and help you focus yourself. Being aware of how you work and the environment you're working in are really important when you're coming up with ideas. But Robin also pointed out that mentorship can be crucial. Think about the Williams sisters or Tiger Woods or Mozart. Their fathers, all of those people's fathers, started them at a very early age. So whether it's, you know, someone like you or a coach or a parent or a sibling or, or a teacher in school, you need guidance. It's unusual not to have somebody teaching you about the discipline from the beginning. And what I love about the book that you have mentioned is that it is a framework. And what that does is it gives someone who maybe doesn't have the confidence or is unsure the ability to flex the muscle and to strengthen themselves and have the confidence in knowing, I can do this. Whenever there's a a checklist or a framework that someone can reference, it does give them that confidence that maybe they didn't have before. And also it really gives people ways to enter the the process. So it's not just um, you start with a goal and that's the only thing you can start with. There are different ways you can enter developing an idea. And I teach people how to notice possibilities. Fabulous. So what are some of the strategies that you write about? One is the main framework, which is three parts to it. It's called the three G's. It's super easy to remember. Three G's, goal, gap, and gain. And you can enter the framework either with a goal or a gap or a gain. And I'll explain it. A goal is very easy. It's what you hope to achieve. But a lot of people think that the goal is the idea, but it's not. It's, It's a goal. The gap is where it starts to get really fascinating. And the gap is something that's missing. And people who are researchers know this because when they start their research, they look and see what exists and what's missing in the discipline. And usually what you hope to do is fill in a void of what's missing. So a gap can be a missing piece, a missing product, a missing service, an underserved audience, an ignored audience, a method that hasn't been utilized. So for example, messenger RNA, it was a new delivery method for medicine that hadn't been tested before or researched before. And luckily, Dr. Katie Carrico and Dr. Weissman did. And that's how we got the COVID vaccines so quickly because of the fact that they were looking at a new delivery system for medicine. Um, Ways to think about toxic-free methods, a more sustainable method, a greener method. Is there a lack of understanding about how something works? So all of these things are gaps. There are pain points, right? People experience pain points at different things, and and those are gaps. And then the gain is really, is there a benefit for someone, for individuals, for society, for creatures, or the planet? Because I think that for an idea to be worthwhile, it has to positively impact people's lives and the planet. We're in an inflection point where we really have to think about the impact of the things that we do. 
It's fascinating. Do you have an example or a story of someone who's maybe struggled or, or had a, a block in terms of having an idea and how they've kind of surpassed it or overcome it? I can give you an example of other ways of using the system. So for example, Kat Nori was in her kitchen making sandwiches for her three children, and she was going to put each sandwich in a plastic disposable sandwich bag. And she thought, this is really wasteful. You know, the the sandwich bag goes into landfill. What if there were a sandwich bag that we could reuse many times? And since she was in um, business of materials, she came up with a silicone sandwich bag that can be used thousands of times. She called it Stasher, and it was so successful that S.C. Johnson bought it from her. I can tell you about other pain points. MasterCard realized that for the LBGTQIA plus community, when you use a credit card or a debit card, it's usually your birth name. Well, it is your birth name, but that's not true name for a lot of people in that community. And MasterCard decided to go to different banks and ask them if they would issue a card using the person's true name rather than their birth name. And that addressed a pain point for that community. And and at first banks said no, and then finally one bank got on board and then other banks got on board. Fascinating. Oh my gosh. I mean, just the power of, of the discussion is huge. And when one starts, others tend to follow. So it just takes one. What great stories. So not only is your book about good ideas, it's about ideas that are worth pursuing. So how do you know that an idea is really worth going after? Yes. I mean, I think that you have to decide if it addresses the, what we call the triple bottom line. So the conventional bottom line is profit. What can I make from this? What's the dollar amount? The triple bottom line is three Ps, people, planet, and profit. And so is there something, some benefit for others, for society, for the planet, for animals, for creatures, other than simply making money? And that's how I think about a worthwhile idea. And then, of course, you could be filling a gap. So, for example, Louis von Ahn, who's a brilliant person, created Capture and Recapture, that thing that we all encounter when it's asking us if we're real or not, to, to fill in, right, to fill in letters. And once he sold that and made a lot of money selling that, he realized because he was born in a country where he spoke Spanish and he had to take an English exam in order to go to university in the States, in the United States, And he realized that you need to have money in order to learn a new language, to have access to that. So he used his money to create Duolingo. So you may know Duolingo. It really is the first free system for learning another language. You know, there's so much great good that people can do. We tend to think of profit, bottom line. But to your point, you're thinking about it from a much larger perspective, which is, I think, very different than what we've heard to this point. And not only are you really upending the way we think about ideas, but you're also flipping the script on the decision filters that we use to think about how we make decisions in the first place. Oh, I love that, decision filters. Yeah. And it can be in the arts too. It's not just an organization or a company or a product. So I'll give you an example, Lin-Manuel Miranda who was working on In the Heights, his first musical. And it was very successful off-Broadway and it was about to come to Broadway and he needed a vacation. And he was going to take his family to a beach in Mexico and he wanted something to read. And because he's a very curious person, rather than picking up a very light beach read, he picked up the biography of Alexander Hamilton. And of course, we know where that ended. The rest is history. (laughs) We know that where that went. And while he's reading it, he's not only is he curious and picking up something outside of his own discipline, but he's reading it and thinking, what if, which is a really key question, what if we told the story of the founding fathers in hip hop and we cross cast it? I mean, he totally changed musical theater genre and expanded it and inspired people. And so by being curious, by asking what if, by filling a gap, 
in musical theater, we have this extraordinary work of art. Talk about breaking those expectations of what creativity is. And when you think about the stasher, the Ziploc bag, and replacing that with with a reusable, which by the way, I think most people don't believe that's creativity. You're just solving a problem, but solving a problem is very creative. So that's why I look at you, Kelly, and you are very creative because you come up with issues and problems and you say, well, this is what we could do to solve it. And that's creative. So I think that's amazing that she can help people break that expectation. Because if everyone thought they were creative and saw that just solving problems is creativity, it'd be a better place. Yeah, it really is all about her giving back. And for her, that gives her immense joy too. So what made you decide to say, ultimately, I have to write a book about this? Well, two things happened very in close time. One was Brooke Roderick, who was a student and got an internship at a very prestigious ad agency. And she came back after her first week and said, Robin, I'm on this creative team with a lot of other interns. And the creative director gave us a problem to solve. And I'm saying, we can do this and we can do this and we can do this. And the other interns are just sitting there. And I thought, okay, well, my method is working. And then another student, Judy, messaged me on Facebook Messenger and said, Robin, I'm at an internship. How do I generate an idea? Because she had never had me as a professor, but someone told her to go ask me. And so I thought, how do I tell her via Messenger very quickly and very simply? And that's when I realized that I really had to codify this for a lot of other people. Yeah, I mean, I certainly raise my hand. Uh, how, how do I generate a worthwhile, you know, idea? I'm I'm in that camp too. And realizing that this is a skill set that you would build just like any other skill set. It does take practice. It does take time. And if you are willing to be open to it and allow yourself to be vulnerable, you can be successful. So, if you have a minute with someone who is who is stuck, who wants to break out, what would you say to them? I would say that to start to be curious about a lot of things. So if you think about Lin-Manuel Miranda, he chose a book about early American history. He, he, you would think he would have chosen a book either just to relax or about the theater or about music or about lyric writing or about marketing a Broadway show. But because he's curious about many things, it opened his mind to something that led to a wonderful idea Be open, as you just said, Kelly. I mean, really, you have to be open to new ideas, to other people's points of view. And that takes me to a very important point, which is being open to diverse and multiple perspectives. So getting input from many different people, an inclusive group, a diverse group, avoiding groupthink is really critical. But anybody can really start to enhance their curiosity, be open to new experiences. Let somebody else choose a film. Let a friend take you to a room in a museum. Let someone else recommend a novel to read. Try a different cuisine. You can just start really small with with lovely things in your life. Go around the dinner table and pose a what-if question. What if we could clone ourselves? What if we could time travel? What if, you know, it's actually a very fun thing to do with kids. That's true. And I think part of it, what I'm hearing from you is just take a chance. Just be open to taking the first step and just see what happens. And I think sometimes I tend to be someone who likes to have it all figured out and I like to know and have a predictable pattern and just kind of know the next step without knowing what's going to happen. But that structured way of thinking, it doesn't apply always to being creative. Like being creative means it's a process and you're not going to know what the next step is. That's part of what it means to be creative. Oh, that's a fantastic point. Oh my gosh. You just hit on a key point, which is uncertainty. You have to start to become comfortable with uncertainty. I'm working on my first book with Carrie. Carrie's working on her second book and it happens to be with me. And we went to a writer's retreat and 
I was totally uncomfortable most of the time because I'm pretty structured and I like to know what's coming next. And Carrie said, you have to abandon that way of thinking. Like you have to be okay with the uncertainty and, and not knowing because that's, that is the creative process. It is a process for a reason. I'm certainly going to pick up the new art of ideas because I know I'm going to need it to get through the next two years with writing this book. So 25 books. Do you have other books in your future? I do. Right now I'm finishing uh, co-authoring a book with Greg Braun, who's the retired global chief creative officer of a huge agency in Detroit. And we're co-authoring a book called Shareworthy, Storytelling for Advertising. And it's about why people would share advertising, what makes that advertising idea a great one that people will engage with it. And now I'm also starting a new book called A Career is a Promise. And it's a book about careers uh, for young professionals. There are a lot of career books, but not many aimed at people just starting out. And it's about finding your purpose, finding success and finding fulfillment. That is definitely in our space. That's our passion. We kind of live and breathe it daily. So what would you say is some advice that you would give to young people who are just starting out? I think it's it's very important to think about not only getting a mentor, everybody knows that a mentor is important, but getting a sponsor once you're in the workplace. Because the difference is a mentor is somebody to guide you and advise you, but a sponsor is the person who's going to help you get promoted. A sponsor is an influential person who's going to put their name behind yours to help you advance in the workplace. And most corporations don't have sponsorship programs. And the way to get one is to be indispensable, is to have people notice you, is to be the expert, is to go around and say, is there something I can help you with? Can I take something off of your plate? And always be there, be responsible, be the best person in the room. I think I wish I had known that starting out, my career would have moved even quicker because most people don't realize how important it is to have somebody be your advocate. Absolutely. I've so enjoyed speaking with you, Robin. And I know Carrie is feeling absolutely sad in that she wasn't able to join us. Um, she's suffering from a cold, lost her voice. I know that this is an episode that is near and dear to her. I'm so grateful that you were able to share your story with us. Thank you so much. You're a wonderful interviewer and lovely individual. And I hope Carrie feels better. Thank you so much for this. I'm honored. I was definitely sad to miss this one, but what a great conversation. She takes a topic that I think is, for me, not overly comfortable and makes it easy to understand. And, you know, even after our conversation was over, I'm actually kind of excited to read about it. And I didn't think I'd be interested, excited, or even motivated. I was like, oh God, idea orientation, creativity. I'll let Carrie take this one. But it, it actually was nice that I was able to talk with her and learn more about it. I just love that she is someone who's still very much in learning and growth mode. She's truly coming from a place of wanting to help people. Absolutely. And Robin donates the profits from all her books to scholarships for students in need. So if you weren't sold on her book yet, you should be now. It's beautiful. If this episode inspired you or made you think, give us a five-star rating and spread the word. It helps us reach more people who just might need these stories. And don't forget to subscribe to The Breakout so you never miss a new episode. I'm Kelly Gunther. And I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. See you next time. <laughs>